You're listening to sermon audio from Ankeny Free Church in Ankeny, Iowa. Our mission is to trust and follow Jesus and to help others to do the same. Join us now as we dive back into our sermon series in the book of Acts, to the ends of the earth. My name's Todd, one of the pastors here at Ankeny Free Church. So good to see you guys this morning. I just want to remind you um, that we will be having an update at 1145. we we'll talk about kind of what all has happened since our annual meeting, what are some of the things that God has done, what are some of the things that we're looking forward to. It won't be terribly long, um, but uh, if you're able to come back, that would be fantastic. We are in the middle of a series here in the book of Acts. We're still on the front end. Acts is a long book. So if you haven't gotten an Acts journal and you want one, oh, there's plenty of time. We will be in the book of Acts for some time. There's journals that have the text on one side, empty pages on the other, and we would love it if, um, if that is a helpful tool for you, for you to grab one of those. It's not too late. We are going to be in chapter 4, and so as you make your way there, let me tell you a little story. One of my favorite presidents is James A. Garfield. James A. Garfield. And the problem, though, is that he was shot in this first year of his presidency. What's interesting, though, is the bullet didn't kill him. What took his life is a problem that we face even as believers today, a problem that the believers faced in Acts chapter 4. You see, back then, even though there was mounting evidence to the contrary, uh, the doctors that were in power didn't think that one needed to wash their hands or clean their surgical instruments. This idea of germs and bugs causing the, these infections just seemed like just utter fantasy. And they wouldn't hear it from other people. And so James Garfield actually died from blood poisoning due to an infection three months after he was shot because of the constant poking and prodding by doctors that refused to wash their hands or their surgical instruments. The status quo was difficult to overcome. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that term, the status quo. It kind of means the, exist, it means the existing state in Latin. And it is this desire to keep things as they are. There are things that are worth preserving. Next year we come upon the, the, the 1700th anniversary of the Council of Nicaea. We... we treasure the holy scriptures we see the movement of the gospel things worth preserving but there are a lot of things that exist just to simply sustain their own existence or they exist even though they hurt other people but those that that benefit from the state existing want to keep it moving you can think of You know, those that were maybe involved in the tobacco lobby, you know, half a century ago. There's dynamics that you know in your own family, your job, among your friends, school. It just seems like that change is very, very hard when there are people benefiting from the way things are right now. And that's our situation here in chapter 4. So the book of Acts, we know, is found in Acts 1.8. We see Jesus saying, you shall be my witnesses. You shall receive power from the, from the Holy Spirit, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And that's how the book of Acts is broken up. We are to be witnesses. That's even our own um, personal mission. And they are still in Jerusalem. And what has happened so far has been that we see that there is a, um, the Holy Spirit has come upon the believers. There are some questions about what was happening. And then Peter preaches this very Jesus-centered message. And then we have in chapter 3, Peter and John are just going to worship. It's like you guys just driving your way to church. 
And when they are on their way, they see this individual who had been there for decades. He was crippled nearby the temple. And through the power of Jesus, this individual is instantaneously, and the scripture says, completely healed. And everyone's pretty amazed. So Peter says, hey, let me share with you what's going on. You guys need to trust in Jesus. Well, there's some people that didn't like that. And we're going to encounter that. Now, throughout the book of Acts, we will see that there is a lot of persecution that happens to the church, to the followers of Jesus as we go along. And that persecution comes from all kinds of different places. And here, I think, the place where the persecution comes is because those in power don't want to see the status quo changed. Now, a couple of things. We are going today to be looking at a passage that gives a historical account. We call this narrative as a type of literature that we see in the Bible. Narrative is usually, um, the main idea is usually found by following the plot and noticing where the tension is. And that's how the author kind of shows where the emphasis is to be. Now that's true here, but actually Luke uses a little bit different tool in which he compares and contrasts two groups of people. And so we see Peter and John. They're the impact of what they want to do. You see their own, the place where they trust in power. And then you also see where their heart is. And in each one of those places, that is contrasted with this group called the Sadducees. The Sadducees. Meridel Jackson told me this after first service. You know, the, they don't believe in the resurrection, so they're sad, you see. <laughs> the Sadducees. Um, distinct from the Pharisees, actually. They are a group of people that were kind of like Jewish nobility. They were virtually royalty. They, they were in charge of all things concerning the temple and were a very powerful group there in Jerusalem. They were wealthy. They were connected. And most people felt like they were corrupt and had given in theologically, have compromised themselves morally because of the way that they work with Rome and the political powers. At this time, we know that the high priest was often not an individual that was chosen because of their integrity, but was the result of, of Rome working with local political forces and then the families there in order to bring about this individual. And often a lot of money was involved as well. So they were rich, they were powerful, they had status, they had influence. And they did not believe in the resurrection. These are the Sadducees. The Pharisees, on the other hand, would have been individuals that were committed to studying and teaching the Hebrew Bible. They would have been operating throughout the country, uh, particularly in the, other, in, the, in the more remote or, or the smaller cities outside of Jerusalem within the synagogues and would have had considerable influence. At times, Sadducees and Pharisees would work together. At other times, they were often at odds. And so we see that this distinct group, they're in Jerusalem, they're going to run into problems because there is growing impact and influence through what Jesus is doing. And they don't like that at all. It's a challenge of the status quo. And so, with that kind of little bit of an overview, I'd like us all to look at Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 22 together. Please turn in your Bibles if you have one. If not, you can simply listen. But if you would, please stand. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them, put them into custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family, 
And when they had set them in their midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, then let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what has happened. For the man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Let us pray. Father, as we approach here this great and mighty force of opposition, the desire to keep things the same, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us and that you would illuminate the Scriptures in order that we might see what you have for us. In fact, Lord, I ask that you would speak through me or in spite of me, but that your Spirit would use your Word to transform us evermore into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So if persecution is going to come, oftentimes through the status quo, well, we need to trust Jesus in the midst of this, right? And so there's going to be three questions that we're going to see here. And there's going to be, because we see in the text this contrast between the Sadducees and this contrast between Peter and John, there's going to be two ways that that these questions are going to be answered. There's going to be a way the status quo answers it, and there's going to be the way the followers of Jesus should answer that. And so let's dive in. The first question, I think, is the question of hope. What is hope? What is hope? What is the thing that one hopes for? What's want? Well, hope for the status quo is that things would stay the same. That is the hope of the status quo, that things would stay the same. We must protect what is currently going on. We see that here in the text. We see that they hear about what's going on, and the Sadducees immediately rally all the forces that they have at their disposal. All right, there's, they, they come, they, they bring other priests, and then they bring the captain of the temple guard. So the temple would have had its own small police force, and they would have worked there to arrest Peter and John. They were, the text says, greatly annoyed. I don't know if you know what it means to be annoyed. Annoyed is going through the drive through getting an order for someone else, realizing they don't like mayonnaise, and they put mayonnaise on the sandwich, but you're already in gridlock traffic. You're done. It's going, and they are getting no food. 
You're annoyed because we're all stalled because there's a car changing its tire on the other side of the highway. I don't have the right food, and I, don't, I can't turn around. That's annoyed, right? Well, this is greatly annoyed. <laughs> this is greatly annoyed. They're greatly annoyed. That this, this is very disturbing. And that's kind of an interesting reaction, isn't it? This individual, an individual they would have seen not just for days or months or years, but for decades. He was, he was crippled there outside the temple, had to be dragged out by those that, that cared for him so that he could beg for food, beg for money. And now, it's not as though he's kind of marginally better. The text earlier says that he was perfectly healed instantaneously. He's standing there. And this doesn't cause confusion or curiosity. It causes anger and annoyance. You know, that's because the hope of the status quo is that things would stay the same. They don't want to lose what they have, and they're willing to do things in order to preserve what they have going on. You know, this kind of explains a lot of things probably in in people's lives, right? It might explain why certain family dynamics go the way they do. It might explain some interesting dynamics that occur in your job. It might explain why the Hawkeyes probably do about the same every year. Just status quo. Is that, is that too much? Sorry. I thought, I thought since they won, maybe I could throw that out there. You know I'm right, at any rate. <laughs> you know, that's this preservation of status quo. But I think for us, we need to look really as a church. I want us to think of ourselves together. And I know a number of churches, unfortunately, that they exist to simply exist. They exist simply to exist. And and they're willing to do anything, it seems, in order to simply exist. You know, maybe even change what they believe, change how they approach things. They just want to make sure that the doors are open. I was looking at a magazine by a a, a movement of churches that has, I think, a number of churches in this situation. And I was just, I was really kind of shocked. And and it, it, I know for a fact this wasn't an isolated incident, but it was filled with little tricks and tips on, you know, how to make, you know, things a little bit better and how to, how to make sure you, that you don't lose people. And, and all this stuff is important, right? We don't want a, a rotten environment. We, we do try to have heating and cooling here. So it's, it's not that we don't try to accommodate what some of the things that we are expecting, but it seems like that that progression has simply moved from being about something greater to just simply making sure that we keep the doors open. I tell you what, it's a powerful force. It's a powerful force. But we need a different hope. And hope for the people of God we see here is in changed lives. Hope for the people of God is changed lives. Contrast the Sadducee's annoyance with this transformed individual, perfectly healed by the power of Jesus. Contrast the Sadducees arresting those that might be speaking with the 5,000 men that have just trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. A, a, a specific number, it, it reminds us of the feeding of the 5,000. That didn't include the women and children. It's a, it's a number of God is doing something here that harkens all the way back to the Old Testament. We, we see that the plan of God is moving forward. And they are looking at a changed life. And so our, our practical point here for us today is that we must be about a mission, not simply to exist. What we need as a church to be on mission, not simply to exist. Here at Ankeny Free Church, we want people to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, to follow him, to help others do the same. It is the mission given to us 
in, in Matthew 28, Mark 13, Luke 24, John 17, Acts chapter 1. And then Paul says it a bunch of times in the letters that he writes, and we get it. Not only is it the thrust of the Old Testament, but it is explicitly stated in the New. It hasn't changed for 2,000 years that we want to be on point with a mission and not just simply be an entity that exists for the sake of existing. I was on vacation in South Carolina and was able to go to a historic church in, South, in Charleston, South Carolina. It was a church that George Washington went to. And I looked on the website, and it seemed like there was a theologically, you know, just on point church. That, that what they were sharing there was the same message that we would be sharing here. It was an Anglican church in the South, so it was pretty formal and structured. And I was on vacation, so I was wearing vacation clothes. And in the South, anyone ever been to church in the South? Yeah, not so much. You don't. You kind of. At any rate, it was, they were very kind, but clearly I was a visitor, and, uh, and everyone knew it without even, you know, whether they could recognize me or not, they could see it in the way I was dressed. Well, at any rate, great service, and I was, as we were about to conclude the service, one of the pastors came up and they said, well, as you may know, that we have lost our final legal battle with the Episcopal Church, and we no longer own this building. So that means that, you know, in the coming weeks, this will no longer be the building that we use. And so I was like, what a, what an announcement. So I'm walking out, where everybody's kind of walking out, and, you know, there's this lady kind of walking out, you know, with us as, as this group goes out, and I was kind of floored by this statement. So I turned to her and I says, you know, I am just so sorry to hear this about your church. And she goes, well, she goes, the church is the people and the mission, not this building. So we didn't lose our church. We just have to meet somewhere else. Those other things didn't change. And I thought, you know what, that's true. It's true, hopefully, for us here. It should be true of every church. The, the church isn't the place, it's the people and the mission that God has for us. And I think that for us to not get sidelined with a false hope. We need to remember that hope is found in transformed lives. And transformed lives occur in people and that the, the transformation occurs through Jesus. And so we want to make sure that we are a church that's focused not on enduring, but on the mission. The second question is one they ask, you know, and it's one that we need to ask too. Where do you find power? Where do you find power? We see here in verse 5, boy, you just get the list. Rulers and elders and scribes. Then you start getting names. Names that might not mean much to you, but would have meant a lot back then. Annas, the high priest. Caiaphas, we'll hear about him later. John and Alexander, this high priestly family. We, we get this sense of, of all that they have, of all that they have gained, and what they're going to be using then this power for. And they ask, verse 7, by what power and by what name did you do this? You see, for the status quo... You know, power is used then to maintain those things. Power, prestige, influence, wealth. That's what power is for. That's what power is for. And that's what they're using this power for. To keep what they have. You, you see, it's, I know they're, they're in an interesting position and they realize that if there's waning influence, they... They, they should be rather concerned. 5,000 people trusting in Jesus. This focus on the resurrection of the dead. This individual that's been perfectly healed, although that's not resurrection from the dead, it's, getting, it's edging close to that kind of power. And they realize we've got to use our power to sort of stop that. Oh, we see this as well when we encounter the status quo standing against the mission of God and even just the status quo in our own lives. You know, the, the, the status quo can be something that, boy, I'm, I'm just wanting things to go well, maybe in my health or maybe with my finances. In this instance, power is used then to maintain the status quo out of a sense of fear. 
And I think the Sadducees were afraid. They're afraid. And I think sometimes when we are afraid, we, we kind of circle the wagons in ways that don't make a lot of sense. That, that are maybe we're willing to fudge on what is right in order to just keep things going. We maybe see it in our jobs. We, we maybe navigate those difficult things in our own family relationships. We, we maybe want to, to use something, and it's, it doesn't seem quite right, but we tell ourselves the ends justify the means. We just don't want instability. We don't want to lose what we have, and so we're willing to, to use power in that particular way. Instead, what we see here is we see, in contrast with that, we see the people of God. <laughs> uh, power comes from Jesus. And again, that power is to transform lives. You know, this power then is, is not to preserve a certain state of being, but to be a blessing to others, uh, to be able to move forward with the mission of God. Look at what Peter says here. He goes, then Peter, look at this, it's just, it's just so, so mission-focused, so Christ-centered. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. So what he's about to do is in line with what God wants him to do. He, not only that, he, he references this amazing deed that just occurred. This crippled man, what are, what are you going to say to this? If you want to know where this comes from, it's from Jesus. And then he begins to share the good news. This Jesus, he died and rose again, and we experience new life in him. In fact, the Old Testament tells us about this, and he quotes Psalm 118, verse 22, how Jesus is the cornerstone upon which we build our life. And then he says this, verse 12. Look back here with me. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now maybe some of you are sitting there going, oof, Peter, that's not very PC of you. It should be a little more inclusive. And maybe there are some, you know, and maybe you've heard this before, that, you know, all roads lead to the same heaven. All religions are kind of pointing the same way. Maybe you've heard it with the three blind men that approach the elephant. Have you ever heard this story before? So they use this as kind of a way to describe, you know, if all roads lead to heaven, maybe it looks like this. And you have these three blind men and the one blind man, they're trying to describe an elephant by kind of feeling the elephant. And the first blind man goes to the leg and he's like, oh, this is a trunk. It must be a tree. Right. And the next blind man goes up to the side and begins touching the side of the elephant. He's like, no, no, it's not a tree, it's a wall. And the third blind man goes to the trunk and he begins to feel that. And To be honest, I, I think if you felt the trunk, you'd be like, I know this is an elephant. But you know, I don't know. <laughs> I've, I've not done this myself, so maybe, you know, maybe it's a snake, a big old snake. I don't know what they're feeling there, but... And the, and the illustration is to show that they're all feeling different parts, but it's, it's, they're all feeling the same animal. The problem with that illustration is, is it supposes that the one person, well, they can see, and they know it's an elephant. And these other people, well, they're just ignorant and incomplete in their knowledge uh, the, the blind elephant illustration is just as exclusive as every other kind of religious notion. And so you, you take no moral high ground in saying that all roads lead to heaven. In fact, it's very dismissive of what other people believe. And instead of taking some, I feel like I'm more inclusive, we should go to what is true, to what is true. Uh, Peter's not saying this to alienate people. Uh, Peter isn't proclaiming Jesus to be innovative or to, to stir up trouble. 
He's pointing people to Jesus because there's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. It's, it's only Jesus. Jesus is our only hope. And, and actually, in some ways, what the ancient Christians faced are some of the same things we faced. Back in the days of Rome, the ancient Christians were considered atheists because they said the pantheon of gods, that's no God. We believe in one God, the Lord. And they would be like, well, what do you mean you don't believe in our other gods? You know, we'll believe in Jesus, but you just got to believe in the rest of the stuff. And it's like, we just, we, 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 don't, we can't do that because it's not true. And, and there's power in that name. There, our only hope is in that name. And ultimately what the Sadducees are doing is they're, they're resting in their status, their wealth, their position to rescue them. And that's a vain hope. And so what we see here is that we need to put our hope in Jesus. That that is where true power resides. That there is hope in no one else. There's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. And so if I can give you an action point here, and is this, is that you need to build your life on Jesus, on Jesus first. You need to build your life on Jesus and Jesus first. Uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus, throughout the book of Matthew, points them that, that hope is found in him. And that's the main G the message that Jesus gives. He says, I'm going to die and rise again, and you know, hope is found in me. And so here, at the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he says this in verse 24. He says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was its fall. Look, problems are going to come. The wind and rains of life are going to come. There's going to be things that are scary that come. But when we build our life upon Jesus, those scary things are put in their proper place. Those, those frightening fears are, are now appropriately dealt with under God and His power and His sovereignty. And it doesn't mean they're not scary, but it does mean that there's a greater power that we have other than them. I like what Elizabeth Elliot wrote. She says this, The secret is Christ in me, not me in a different set of circumstances. The secret is Christ in me, not me in a different set of circumstances of circumstances. And that's what we need. And it comes to this question of power. There is one name that rescues us, and that is Jesus. The last question then is, well, what should we say? And here we have two messages. We have two messages. Verse 13, they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men. So this meant that they were uneducated, not that they were dumb, but that they hadn't been to the rabbinic and priestly schools. They were common because they would have been considered royalty or nobility there. They, they had six, some specific kind of roles, and it tied into their priestly roles within the temple. All that kind of comes together. And they are those kinds of people, and Peter and John are those kinds of people. And so we see that they are, that, that's the, this distinction but they had been with Jesus. They fully recognized the reality of the situation. This man had been healed. Everyone in Jerusalem realizes this is a miracle. We recognize this is a miracle. But we also realize this is a problem to the status quo. So the message of the status quo is silence because they want to control the people. 
The message of the status quo is silence because they want to control the people. They're, they aren't elected officials. Uh, they're, they're not there because of a popular vote, but yet they realize that their situation is precarious. And, and they still are there because other people are now falling into line. We, we see this in other places as well. I know that, you know, this is a quasi-governmental entity and this is also persecution. The next passage will be uh, about the believers praying for boldness kind of in response to this. So I felt like next week would be good to deal particularly with the global persecuted church because it is the International Day of Prayer for the persecuted church and to kind of acknowledge that we are having an election a few days after next week and to be able to kind of, I think this passage helps, gives us um, some truth in that situation. However, we do see this, this effort of silencing. And we might experience it personally, but we can even see it in certain situations. Um, one situation is India. I don't know if you guys realize this or not, but Christian organizations that deal with poverty, like Samaritan's Purse, Compassion International, Global Fingerprints, they've all been kicked out of India, and they have been for some time. Uh, they don't want that kind of Christian influence. They, they feel like you talk, it's not illegal to be a Christian in India, but it is illegal to share the gospel. It is illegal to tell someone else about Jesus in order that they might believe in Jesus. And the reason is, is there's something that they're trying to preserve, um, the existing state of affairs. And, and it has a combination to do with, with Hinduism and just even then the control of other people. Because the gospel changes lives. In particular, the gospel gives value to the lowliest of people. A, a value that they don't get from the current system. A, a value that actually serves the current system to keep those in power and control, in power and control. Now, I don't want to pretend to be able to accurately explain the, the complicated and intricate and varied system that is India in, in 30 seconds, but I think that does give us a hopeful gist on why we see so many efforts to kind of clamp down on the gospel message there in India. They, they want to maintain their status and the status quo needs silence in order to be able to control people. <laughs> the message of the followers of Jesus, though, is quite different, isn't it? Oh, it's the good news. It's the good news in order to be a blessing to the people. It's good news in order to be a blessing to the people. Uh, 5,000 men, not counting the women, not counting the children, just trusted in the Lord just there. I mean, we already had a church of 3,000. We're doing pretty good, folks. They're, they're crushing it. And, and they're crushing it not because they want to be a large entity, but because the good news is good news for everyone. And they want them to experience the power of the Spirit, the refreshment that comes from the forgiveness of sins. And that is what is on their tongue. How are they able to say things like, we verse 18, verse 19, whatever, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. I, come on, are you kidding me? Are we going to listen to you or are we going to listen to God? That'll be said again in chapter 5. We must obey God rather than man. Time and time again, they're going to be put in this position on whether we listen to God or whether we listen to these people that just want to control others. But they can't stop but to speak what they have seen and heard. You know, the real practical point for us in this is found in verse 13. They saw the boldness of Peter and John. And, and they realized they didn't have status. They didn't have the markings of this rabbinic or priestly education. Uh, they didn't have special distinction within the temple. They probably didn't even have a lot of money like they did. 
Uh, they had been using the temple and the temple system <coughs> to simply line their own pockets and to keep their own power. And these people are actually a blessing. Well, we see the transformation of people's lives that are going on here. That's what they saw. And that boldness came from where? And they'd recognized that they had been with Jesus. Now granted, Peter and John were with Jesus in a way we could never be. They were with Jesus physically up to the crucifixion. They were with Jesus when he came back to make an appearance to him. I grant you with that. But in some ways, Luke is telling us that they were with Jesus and we should be with Jesus as well. And here's our point, is that boldness comes from spending time with the Lord. Boldness comes from spending time with the Lord. Look, I, you guys are brave. I, I tell you what, if you play golf, you're not afraid to talk about golf. If, if you watch a lot of politics, you're not afraid to speak out on the current issues of the day. If you spend a lot of time in sports, you're not afraid to chime into a conversation about this team or that team. What you, what you spend a lot of time with, maybe it's your work, maybe it's with your kids, maybe you have a crazy family and you just like it consumes all your time and you'll just that's what's on your heart and out it comes well you know look i'm not saying that we need to get rid of all that stuff but man you know what we need on our heart we need jesus that's exactly right and that comes from spending time with the lord Dallas Willard says, the greatest gift you can give your friends is your personal devotion to God. John Piper says, desiring God is not an option. It is a necessity for a transformed life. This is not optional. We want to be about what God wants us to be about. We have to spend time with him. We want to see the work of God in our lives. We've got to spend time with him. I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward, and I want to share with you one last story. Many of you know David Kareto. He's a missionary partner in Kenya. He works with the Maasai, and the Maasai tend to be, I don't know, akin to the Amish. They've really resisted kind of modernization. They've, they've resisted a lot of the things that have happened and the people around them. They kind of like to keep the status quo. If there's any group of people that love the status quo, it is the Maasai. They, they dress the same. They do the same things they've been doing for hundreds of years, a very similar way of life. And when the Lord opened David Corrado's eyes, uh, his dad had a very prominent position. And so he resisted. He had to fight against trusting in Christ meant resisting the status quo religiously. It meant resisting the status quo for his tribe. It meant resisting the status quo for his family. And, and it even meant resisting the status quo for a lot of things that were held more broadly culturally. And, and he, but he wanted to be a blessing for people. He wanted to be a blessing um, for for young women that were being mutilated. He wanted to be a blessing uh, for those that were hungry and needed some food or water. He wanted to be a blessing in order that the gospel might go forward. And through his life, the Lord has used him to plant almost 400 churches throughout Kenya and Tanzania. We, we all know Dave, David. I know him as David. I talked to a person that lived in his city, and he goes, oh, you mean the bishop? <laughs> Oh, everybody knows the bishop. <laughs> and riding with him, he's like a celebrity there as well. And um, this doesn't come from his desire to keep status or fame, but because he has given his life for so many. Um, but I'd like us to take a moment and pray for him. His son um, emailed or texted me uh, yesterday. So the day before, uh, David was hit by a motorcycle, and he's currently in a coma. And, um, and so... I want to just take this opportunity for someone who's a, great, who's a great example of battling the status quo and pray for him together, if you would. Father, we ask that we would be people that um, aren't consumed by the seemingly irresistible force of the status quo. Instead, O oh Lord, we would preserve what is good and right, but that we would have ears for you a heart that trusts you, Lord, a, a hope that's bound in you and the change that 
faith in your name brings. Oh, the transformation of the one man was but symbolic of the greater transformation that occurred among the 5,000 that heard and believed the message. Lord, I pray that we would be a church that isn't just an institution, but that continues to be on mission. That we would be a people that is focused on the good news going forth. That we would be transformed in order that we might lead others through that same transformation. And so, Lord, we pray for David. Lord, I, I pray that he comes out of his coma. I pray that you restore him to health. Whether you do or not, Lord, we know that your mission is going forth there, that the gospel is spreading, and that lives are being changed because David and the thousands of others uh, trusted in you, took their hope in you, not a hope that just resides in keeping things the same. I pray that for us. I pray that we would be a church that that, that isn't concerned with the status quo, but is concerned with the only sort of new creation that comes from you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. If you would please stand. didn't think that one needed to... We pray that you were blessed and encouraged by this week's message. And we invite you to join us every Sunday morning, in person or online, for morning worship. Have questions about what it means to know and follow Jesus? Simply email Todd at AnkenyFree.Church. Thanks for listening.